Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another R3P Child pop-up policy event uh, coming to you from downtown Calgary, the headquarters of the Canada West Foundation. I'm Carlo Day, Director of the Center for Trade and Investment here at the Canada West Foundation, and it's a real pleasure to be back with you talking uh, about an issue of, well, by the attendance and the rapid attendance that we got for this event, an issue that's obviously of great interest and concern to us across the West, and that is the impacts of the COVID pandemic on the border. Before getting started, uh, let me just take a second to acknowledge um, you know, what a good day this is for Canada uh, with the return of Michael Spavor and Michael Korvik uh, back to Canadian soil. Uh, that really kept us up and kept us busy at the Trade and Investment Center uh, over the weekend. But I think it's really important that we've finally been able to take the yellow ribbons off the front door of the Canada West Foundation. And that's something I just would like to acknowledge before we get started. But turning to today's event, you know, when we normally talk about supply and production chains and logistics, uh, it, it's guaranteed to get the general public's eyes to glaze over. But that's changed with the pandemic. Every day we have another story that speaks to a pain point that Canadians, not just large businesses, but increasingly smaller businesses are, are, are facing. Consumers are now getting worried about whether or not there'll be anything under the Christmas tree. Uh, so while those stories come to us from China, from the Suez Canal, the pain points for us out West are also been along the border and the worries about what's going to happen uh, going forward along the border are equally um, of concern to us. So delighted that we were able to team up with our good friends at Western Washington University, the Border Policy Research Institute. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, they do some really great work. They're our go-to source when we have questions uh, about the border issues. Dr. Lori Troutman, who runs the center, is with us today to present an overview of their border barometer, looking at the impact of the pandemic on the border. We also have Jeffrey Hale uh, from Lethbridge, uh, University of Lethbridge, who wrote the Prairie chapter of the report. Uh, Dr. Hale has been a great ally of Canada West and someone we turn to with our work on subnational engagement. And also in the office in Calgary, we have the fully vaccinated John Law, who's sitting down the hall from the fully vaccinated director of the Trade and Investment Center, uh, joining us to talk about the supply and production uh, implications of uh, the border. So before I get started, just let me note, you know, the only thing I've said consistent, I've said consistently, the only thing worse then what we've just gone through with the border is going through it again when the next pandemic or public health emergency strikes. So part of what we want to do today is to step back and look at what's happened, but do so not with the airing of individual problems and grievances and issues that have arisen. We will take note of those and those are being collected, but this one, this chance is really an opportunity to look at what's happened and to start thinking to make sure that this doesn't happen again. We realize that businesses are concerned with just making it to the end of the week, just dealing with the current problem that threatens to shut them down. But if there also isn't an effort made to look at making sure we don't repeat this, it's almost a guarantee that we will repeat this next time. So here at the Canada West Foundation, we're looking ahead, um, fully cognizant of the pain that's out there now, fully cognizant of the urgent necessity to clear up current issues. Our relative advantage here is that we can also take a look ahead. And that's what we'd like to do today, starting with what's happened along the border. So Dr. Troutman will run us through the overview of the uh, report. Dr. Hale will burrow down on the prairies, and then John Law will follow with um, some of these supply and logistics chain issues for us here on the prairies and out west. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Troutman. 
Thank you, Carlo, and thank you to everybody who's joined us today. I do have a few slides. I'm going to highlight some data points and then be a little bit more sort of reflective and provide some food for thought. So I'm going to share my screen and hope that I do it in a seamless manner. Uh, it looks like it is going okay. So um, I guess I wanted to start out by just sort of laying the groundwork and saying that um, the border restrictions have been very confusing this entire time, this year and a half that they've been in place. They've varied by mode, they varied by country, they varied by trip purpose. And largely, you know, federal border policy is always a one size fits all approach. And that's been a problem before the pandemic and certainly the pandemic really illustrated that. And the impacts of the border restrictions and of border policy in general, even though they are one size fits all approach, they really vary by region. And that's because we are connected in different ways. And so I think one of the fundamental problems we've dealt with over the past year and a half is that we don't really have a good understanding of the value of those cross border connections, the tangible economic impacts of them. And that's made it difficult to both assess the impacts of the restrictions, but more importantly, to advocate for solutions to them. So the border barometer is um, something that my institute has done every few years for about 12 years or so. And it's really meant to illustrate and evaluate the influence of the border itself, whether that's port of entry infrastructure, that's economics. Sometimes we look at wait times, sometimes we look at trade flows. And this time around, we said, well, given the unprecedented nature of the pandemic restrictions, we're going to focus this 2021 report on their impact. So I led the effort, but it was really a collaborative endeavor between eight different researchers looking at communities from Alaska all the way to Maine. And we were supported by six different Canadian consulates and fully funded by the government of Canada. And I think that in and of itself is really important that that collaboration and that support was there to be able to carry out this research, which is really the most comprehensive look at the impact of the restrictions. And I will say that we focused largely on US communities because so many Canadians are the ones kind of dominating land border flows. But we also looked, of course, on the Canadian side as well. And we looked, um, we tried to illustrate really the regionally specific issues. Jeffrey will touch on some of those in your region after I speak, but we also looked at some of the common impacts that businesses and communities face regardless of where they were on the border. And specifically, you know, certainly the tourism industry was impacted no matter where that industry was and families were separated regardless of what part of the border they were living in. Um, we also looked at subnational collaboration specifically because we thought that was a very important part of the story of how the border works and how communities and regions interact with the border. So I only got two slides for data. I won't get too deep into them, but I do want to kind of lay the foundation for what the Canada-US land border typically has looked like um, over the past 20 plus years. We had declining numbers in the late 90s that was largely associated with a declining Canadian dollar. And then that red circle there shows the dip after 9-11. Well, you can see the dip in 2020 was far worse than the dip in 9-11 and much more prolonged as well. And so I truly think that we're facing a new era of border management and certainly a new era of the way the border works, who's crossing, why they're crossing, and that is going to vary by region. So I'd say in my region, Cascadia, which is the Western British Columbia, Western Washington area, our border has traditionally been dominated by very short, very frequent trips, primarily for shopping in places very close to the border. And as a result, we have entire communities and industries that have been built up around that Canadian, largely Canadian flow. Well, that flow is gone. It's gone now, it's been gone for a year and a half and I don't think it's gonna come back anytime soon because we are going to have a new way of managing our border. And that's gonna look very different from say the Detroit Windsor region where people crossed primarily for work and they've continued to cross throughout this pandemic. So really highlighting the regional variances is very, very important, especially now. If we just take a quick look at, at truck traffic, which is a great proxy for Canada US trade, over $340 billion worth of goods travels by truck between Canada and the US um, in a typical year, as was the case in 2019. And you can see that red line is truck travel in 2020. And really what we saw was a brief dip at the early months of the pandemic, largely around 
um, shutdowns and you know pandemic era supply chain issues, but that really returned fairly quickly by fall of 2020. And that's because the US and Canada border restrictions enabled essential travel or commercial cargo to travel back and forth. What it didn't necessarily enable was the people that had to travel back and forth to support those trade relationships. So the inability for people to cross the border, that lack of business negotiations that usually occurs in a face-to-face -face scenario or site visits for manufacturing areas is likely to have a prolonged impact on these trade relationships that we really have yet to see, haven't quite manifested yet. So I wanna highlight just a couple things that, um, you know, those of us who have been looking at these border restrictions that contributed to the barometer, what do we see as some of the underlying challenges um, that really is kind of a food for thought exercise. Um, there's an incredible lack of data and understanding on the impacts of the border. And this was of course true before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, this was really highlighted because so many people, whether it was the government of Canada, the government of the United States, states, provinces, wanted data on what's the economic impact of the border restrictions on our communities and our economies. And that data was really, really hard to come by. There's just not enough of us engaged in that data. And then we also entered this, this time frame during an incredible policy void. Certainly four years of the Trump administration did not set us up well for good Canada-US relations. We had a hollowing out of some very key diplomatic channels combined with an absence of any Canada-US border policy framework. We don't have one post beyond the border. And so I think that really left a lot of agencies in both countries without a mandate to work across the border, to reach across the border and try to solve these, these problems that we were facing. Um, there's certainly very little to almost no transparency or communication coming out of the White House. Um, I think to a certain extent, Canada faced that issue as well for much of the pandemic, but it's clearly moved beyond that. And, um, you know, the U.S. today still has no plan for lifting the land border restrictions. And that has been devastating for businesses and families that throughout this pandemic have asked for some kind of metrics, some kind of time frame some kind of structure so that they could begin to plan for what might come next. And, and they've been giving absolutely nothing. And so I think all of this combined to really create sort of the perfect storm when we had a lack of structure, a lack of capacity, and really a lack of urgency. And in the United States, this was certainly compounded by the preoccupation we tend to have with our Southern border, the Northern border sort of gets put by the wayside and we didn't have that political engagement and we still don't have it. It played out a little differently in Canada with the federal election being called and some very good systems being put in place leading up to that. So what does that mean from, for what do we learn? Where do we go from here? Um, certainly at the federal scale, it's very clear we need a new Canada-US border policy accord. Many of us are advocating for a US congressional commission to look at the pandemic border restrictions. If that were to come to fruition, it would provide a great amount of research and data and capacity that could set us up to really prevent the same situation from happening in the future. Um, absolutely, we need more data for evidence-based policymaking. As I mentioned before, I think we are entering a new era of border management. Canada has one system in place at the land border. The US has no system in place. Even when the US does develop a system for the land border, it's not gonna be the same as the one that Canada has. And that's gonna be very confusing and very complicated. And we need, I would say now more than ever, the ability to understand what the repercussions and the cost of that is. And I think um, the other thing we can learn is that subfederal engagement throughout the border restrictions has been fantastic. There have been so many groups and so many organizations, I've listed just a few of them here, that have been really engaged in advocating, not just um, for communication around the border restrictions, but for solutions as well. And I think it's largely up to these entities to propose solutions and really remind Ottawa and DC that a functioning border is critical for both our countries, for so many of our businesses and our communities and our families. Because if there's something I've learned this past year and a half, it's that border communities and even cross-border regional economies more broadly, really literally and figuratively get pushed to the margins during these times. And so I'll close just by showing you an example of kind of a model of success that happened in my region, Cascadia, really over the last year and a half. And it, it was successful because we already had the players 
and the capacity and the framework in place to work together. And I won't walk through all of these, but I just wanna highlight that across scales, whether it was local, it was state, uh, regional, national, federal, and binational, we had connections and cross-pollination and ongoing conversations across these scales. And many people from our region, um, even at the local level, were also involved in those binational efforts. And that was really created an intentional amount of engagement a lot of um, problem solving and solutions. And I just close in saying that, you know, we can't change federal policy at the regional scale, but we can make it work better for our region. And we certainly experienced that in the Cascadia region. Uh, one final example I'll give you is that our governor just last week announced a, a border business relief program, which is a small grant program for businesses that have been impacted by the border restrictions. And that was a direct culmination of research and data that was provided, engagement and collaboration across scales, and a real partnership to provide some relief to these businesses that have been impacted by the restrictions. So I will stop there. I will stop screen sharing and I'll hand it over to Jeffrey. Thanks very much, Lori, and thank you to Carlo for your invitation uh, <clears throat> to this event and to Lori for her leadership of the border barometer process. Uh, my comments today uh, will look at key findings of the border barometer project related to Alberta and other prairie provinces. Uh, they'll look at important developments on border management and cross-border trade since then, and some of the lessons learned for application to and hopefully mitigation of uh, potential border uh, disruptions arising from public health emergencies in the future. Uh, this, uh, this presentation also draws on research uh, for a collaborative volume uh, that I'm working on with uh, Kathy Brock and to which Lori has contributed on uh, uh, managing Canadian federalism beyond pandemic because we have found that, <clears throat> well, borders are primarily a federal responsibility. Uh, when you bring in anything to do with the management of the economy or the management of public health, uh, provinces play an outside role, uh, as do many American states. And so uh, this is something that needs to be uh, considered very carefully as we move forward from here. Uh, first of all, uh, Alberta and a key finding of this, of this study is certainly the regional dimension, was that Alberta and its prairie neighbors have very different patterns of trade and travel flows along the 1400 kilometers of their functional borders with the United States. And when I say functional borders, uh, it, it recognizes the fact that trade corridors are not designed along jurisdictional lines. Uh, so that, for example, the largest uh, component of uh, rail freight across the uh, International Falls, Minnesota bridge with uh, Northwestern Ontario comes from and goes to Alberta. Uh, and uh, so these long distance corridors uh, linking Alberta, but also Saskatchewan and Manitoba with destinations across the continent uh, means that unlike many other regions, our, um, our trade patterns and our travel patterns are multi-regional. Uh, and for Alberta, uh, there is a disproportionate dependence on not just pipelines, which are critical, but also rail transportation for bulk commodities. The same applies in Saskatchewan, uh, whereas Manitoba is far more dependent on truck transport, as indeed are most other parts of the country. Uh, the uh, three provinces have very different trade and export profiles, very different trade profiles with different regional markets in the United States. Uh, and it was, it's interesting to look at the interaction between consular regions and the transborder region, because Alberta's dom predominant uh, export markets are in the Middle West uh, with the uh, shipment of uh, oil and natural gas uh, to uh, refinery hubs in uh, in Illinois and far and and uh, and uh, down towards the Gulf states, uh, whereas in Saskatchewan you have a tremendous uh, dispersion of export trade with an enormous uh, an enormous volume of resource trade going across the northern tier of the United States uh, to Oregon and beyond. Uh, 
Uh, Alberta is unique among Canadian provinces in having greater volumes of cross-border air travel than uh, cross-border land travel. Uh, reflection of the fact both that uh, there are enormous distances to major population centers in the United States compared with most other regions, but also the fact that the reconfiguration of air travel uh, in recent years in Canada has uh, resulted in uh, Calgary becoming a, trans, uh, a transit point for travelers from other parts of Western Canada. And we saw this in the impact of the air travel disruptions uh, affecting air travel in medium-sized airports in Saskatchewan and Manitoba as well. Uh, these factors uh, place an enormous emphasis on cross-border collaboration to deal with various sectoral issues which affect the border and, and vice versa. And I'd like to uh, give a shout out to uh, Richard Godfrey, uh, MLA from Calgary, who I believe is on the call today and is the incoming uh, president of the pa Pacific Northwest Economic Region. And certainly, uh, Mr. Gottfried and his colleagues at Pinworth have, uh, have done a terrific job in trying to navigate some of the intergovernmental and business government issues affecting the border over the last number of years. Um, moving on to pandemic impacts, the, the most central pandemic impact has come from uh, two factors. First of all, uh, we had the sharp drop in global oil and gas prices and demand, which uh, coincided with the pandemic. And these have recovered pretty well since the third quarter of last year. Prices are, are, uh, are above forecasted levels, and we may even see shortages pushing those levels higher this winter, especially for natural gas, which is trending well above re uh, recent uh, the prices of recent years. Uh, the second factor is the impact of the pandemic's first wave on agri-food supply chains, particularly those related to the uh, meat processing sector, its suppliers and customers. Uh, most industry players adapted well to the pandemic. However, as John Law will, uh, will discuss later in, the, in this webinar, we've had a series of knock-on effects uh, with subsequent disruptions of supply chains across a wide range of fields uh, in the, uh, during the pandemic recovery. Uh, so the, the, the impact on trade and supply chains has not simply been a matter of the pandemic disruption, but of the uneven recovery and the, 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 the uneven patterns of vaccination and control of subsequent variant waves of the pandemic. Uh, findings of the study show that overall truck freight flows on the border came close to recover, covering their 2019 levels uh, by December last year. Uh, shipments were down 14% in uh, May and June of last year. Uh, they have now recovered those levels and moved beyond them. Uh, and this, as Lori has mentioned, has been due to effective Canada-US cooperation in maintaining overall trade flows at the border. Uh, another key factor that plays into the equation has been the uh, cooperation between provincial and state governments in facilitating the vaccination of long-haul truck drivers uh, who, who are critical to maintaining uh, cross-border flows. Uh, that began cooperation between uh, Manitoba and North Dakota uh, in, in that, in, in that uh, I-29 corridor. Uh, moved on to include Saskatchewan, Montana, and Alberta. And, and again, the, uh, Mr. Gottfried and the folks at Pinworth uh, did, a, did yeoman service in smoothing uh, those discussions to, uh, to bring about that kind of collaboration with our American friends having an earlier supply of vaccine than uh, was available uh, to, uh, uh, to Canadian public health officials. Uh, the pandemic's impact on tr travel and tourism in the region has been far more severe uh, than, than on the trade side, particularly for air travel, but also for land travel. 95% uh, of land travel uh, was uh, eliminated across the prairies uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic and really hasn't recovered to a, uh, a, a considerable degree, although we are late on getting statistics because of the the conventional lag in accessing both American and Canadian border statistics. 
uh, for air travel. Uh, air travel was down more than 90% uh, in, uh, you know, in the winter of 2021 compared to the previous period in uh, 2020-2019. And uh, we've seen some partial recovery uh, in that process uh, since the partial opening of the, uh, of the border to uh, air travel for vaccinated travelers. But we still have uh, transborder flights running at about 20% of where they were uh, two years ago. And overall, uh, air passenger travel, domestic and foreign, is, is running about 42% uh, of, uh, of 2019 levels. So for, uh, for the larger cities on the prairies uh, and smaller city, uh, travelers from smaller cities who connect to them, uh, this, has, uh, this has greatly complicated uh, travel. And, and, and the reality is that uh, the current testing regime, while it is necessary from a public health standpoint, does significantly add to already substantial costs to travel across the border. Uh, the one, uh, exception uh, to this uh, pattern uh, was a pattern of a period of about three months between November of 2020 and January of 2021, where we had a pilot project involving the government of Alberta and the federal government, CBSA, attempting to coordinate uh, testing and tracing of travelers in air borders and land borders. Uh, historically, there has been very little connection uh, between uh, public health administration and border management. And that was painfully apparent uh, during the first uh, eight, or eight months or so of the pandemic, uh, where the, the connections between CBSA uh, managing the flow of travelers through airports and provincial public health officials uh, was, uh, was totally inadequate. And uh, over time, there was the negotiation of the pilot project between Alberta and, 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 uh, and uh, CBSA to facilitate the testing and tracing of travelers so that rather than public health and border facilitation functioning in silos with, with minimal communication with one another, there was actually a substantial effort at coordination. And, and we found about one percent of the travelers in that process, both air and land, uh, did have COVID infection. So uh, while this was not enormously greater or lesser than, than, than domestic air travel, it showed that this was a, a valid and necessary process. Unfortunately, the disruption between the Ontario and federal governments uh, during January and February 2020 blew up that process. And it took until August of this year, really, to, to, to get an alternative process involving adequate testing and screening of vaccinated travelers uh, at the borders. And that is still a work in progress, uh, as, far as, as far as we understand. Uh, while it's being partly implemented, the level of communication is still a work in progress, particularly when it comes to uh, integrating the data management and tracking system between federal and provincial governments. So what are some of the ongoing lessons of the pandemic? I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I think I'm probably running close to uh, the edge of my time. Uh, first of all, enabling ongoing economic activity and protecting public health do not function as either or trade-offs during public health, uh, during periods of stressed public health. Uh, our governments have been slow to recognize and respond to these risks as they relate to international travel. I think the federal government has it close to being right uh, at the moment, but coordination with the United States would make it substantially easier, uh, as, as Lori has mentioned. Uh, information sharing between directly related federal and provincial agencies, such as public health, food safety, and emergency management, reasonably decent during the pandemic. Key factor in those uh, communications relationship is that they existed before the pandemic. Uh, in any emergency plan, if you don't know the people you are dealing with before the emergency hits, that is the worst time possible to uh, try to connect with people who are, who are in the business of fighting fires. Uh, and our public health people had a cooperative 
plan for their with their counterparts in uh, at the federal government uh, across all provinces. Uh, our emergency management people had a functioning relationship with their federal counterparts. Uh, our agri-food people uh, actually were recruiting provincial health agencies. There was a collaborative reassignment of, of, uh, of food inspectors to ensure that meatpacking plants did not shut down. Where that did not apply was with the CBSA and that took months to stand up. And that is a major gap that has to be filled in future. Um, the uh, going forward, uh, both governments could learn from processes that, that the more successful agencies put in place three years before the pandemic or longer uh, to determine who would be doing what. Uh, the, the information we have in our research suggests that when those deals were struck, uh, people knew their responsibilities and they stuck to their knitting and they backed up one another when necessary. Um, and such planning should also build in room to involve the trans representation of the transportation uh, sector, uh, whether the various trucking associations, uh, airport authorities, airlines, whose support and involvement will be necessary to implement these plans. Uh, we, see, we saw one excellent case of emergency response from the federal government, and that had to do with water management. Uh, the century uh, uh, old infrastructure along the St. Mary's Diversion Canal uh, took the opportunity of the pandemic to collapse uh, during uh, May of 2020, shutting down irrigation services, both to uh, uh, southern parts of Southern Alberta and cent North Central Montana. And it took a full court press from about 10 Canadian agencies 44 US and state and tribal government agencies to uh, rebuild uh, that infrastructure, including the creation of a temporary port of entry to facilitate the delivery of construction materials to, to remote sites south of the border. Uh, the fact that Ottawa and the provinces could work together in that way uh, reflected well on both of them and, and uh, our neighbors in Montana did an outstanding job of coordinating the different state, tribal and federal government agencies involved in that process. Uh, but the one thing we learned from that is that there's more of that infrastructure that has the capacity to break down. And uh, hopefully our American friends uh, will be investing in the pre, uh, uh, ahead of the curve next time rather than waiting for the system to collapse. Uh, measures introduced by the federal government since July of this year uh, have, I think, improved the capacity to coordinate cross-border travel with, uh, with, uh, with public, health, uh, public health provisions. However, uh, as Lori has mentioned, the land border has a long way to go uh, and it is being held hostage to uh, the complications on the Mexican border in the United States. And that's something that has to be worked on on an ongoing basis. Uh, because of the sectorally varied nature of these, uh, of these challenges, there's no one size fits all approach. They have to be worked out on a sector by sector basis, uh, but they also need coordination from central agencies. So these sector provisions do not work at cross purposes. However, as Lori has noted in her uh, discussion of cross-border relations in the Cascadia region, there is no substitute to building relationships uh, with relevant counterparts in other governments and with private sector stakeholders as well before a crisis hits to understand one another's capacities and work out a division of responsibilities uh, that help the, those responsible to work out details in the middle of a crisis. Uh, we found that that can be made to work the, past, the, the recent pandemic, but an awful lot more has to be done to avoid these problems in the future. Carlos, to you and to John. Well, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, just a quick reminder to folks, uh, the question and answer uh, feature is active with this webinar. So feel free, please send in questions. I'll obviously take the first two questions, but as we turn it over now for a deeper look, into some of these supply uh, and logistics chain issues. If you do have questions, please uh, send them in. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to John. 
Thanks, Carlo. I'm going to uh, walk through a few slides and uh, hopefully can move through these fairly quickly. Uh, the first couple of which are really intended as reminders of the nature of some of the cross-border movements that uh, are significant for economies on both sides of the border. This first slide is intended to uh, simply remind people of the fact that exports that originate in Canada often have inputs as part of their supply or value chains, which rely on imports before those exports can go out. There are a number of examples provided here to show you significant percentages of imported intermediaries that go into some of these exports. And I thought that this was uh, important in the context of uh, being able to uh, remind people of the cross-border activity that takes place. Within the context of that sharing, if we think about the United States and Canada relationship, you can see from this second slide that a significant proportion of what goes into Canadian pro production comes directly from the United States. Most of us are familiar with the example that is often used of automobiles uh, being produced after a half dozen to eight uh, movements of value chain activity uh, across the border. The final sort of preliminary slide that I wanted to share was one to just really provide a reminder to folks of the significant and consistent growth in the decade that preceded the pandemic um, of trade activity specifically. Both imports and exports uh, from 2009 to 2019 grew by approximately four and a half percent each on an annual basis. So this was a, a significant, uh, I'm not? Oh. Can you help me here, Carlo? I'm sorry. I uh, thought I was sharing my slides. And you got the share screen is on. Sorry about that, folks. Apparently, my slides weren't being shared. Are they there now? Okay. Okay, my apologies. Yeah, sorry about that, folks. We're uh, working out the technical difficulties. Uh, if you want to stretch your legs for 20 seconds, that's great, but we should have it worked out. Uh, in under a minute or so. So hang in there. 
I can see it. Can others? Okay. It's on, John. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. My apologies about uh, that, folks. Here's a, I'll again, try and go fairly quickly. The first slide that I wanted to show you was just the interconnectedness of supply chains between imports and exports that cross the border. But uh, in this, in this instance, you can see uh, significant percentages of our export production that require intermediary imports in order for us to produce those things that are so significant for the 66% of our gross domestic product in Canada that comes via trade. And this is particularly significant in the context of um, the relationship with the United States. Next slide, Carlo. Here is a, a slide that shows you the significance of the relationship between Canada and the United States when it comes to cross-border movements for production. Again, uh, with a significant proportion of these representative examples of production, there are others that equally are uh, as reliant upon a relationship with the United States to have product production go across the border frequently before final products are produced. This one showing the significance of US involvement in the supply of imports that go into our export production. Next one, please. Um, this was a slide that I wanted to uh, show to remind people about the significance of diversification and globalization, which was really a key growth strategy in the decade preceding the pandemic for Canadian businesses and not just multinationals, but also for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, to take advantage of opportunities to, to grow their markets and their profit bottom lines on the basis of growing market opportunities. So we had a decade of growth from 2009 to 2019, which averaged about 4.5% uh, increase per annum for both imports and exports for Canada. It was very significant, uh, with the United States being a major part of that growth. Next slide, please, Carlo. Uh, just a quick reference here to the difficulty in terms of this, what I describe as a stop, start, stopped impact on the Canadian economy. Um, if just to use the uh, year 2020 as an example, in the first two years of 2020, uh, the economy contracted uh, in quarter one by 7.9% and in the second quarter by about 38%. Um, but by the third quarter, the, a, a real rapid recovery was underway uh, in which the Canadian economy expanded by about 42%, um, with a, a slowdown in the fourth quarter to about 9.3%. Obviously, from a trade production and supply chain management perspective, this creates a number of significant issues. Um, but on an overall basis in 2020, we had what was at the time a record decline in our overall GDP of 5.3%. Um, international uh, trade was one of the hardest hit aspects, as uh, both Laurie and Jeffrey have talked about, um, due mainly to lower bilateral trade with the United States. Uh, both Canadian imports and exports suffered double-digit declines 
so that by the end of 2020, while many countries had recovered, at least partially uh, from the pandemic, the pace of recovery was and continues to be still very much dictated by the direction in which the virus uh, is headed and the new variants attached to it. Next slide, please, Carlo. One of the things that both Jeffrey and Lori talked about that I thought was really important to highlight in a couple of different ways was the unevenness of both the impacts and the recovery from the pandemic. Um, here you can see a slide in which I've differentiated the impacts on goods compared to services. Um, you can see the, the numbers here uh, showing a significant decline uh, at about the same time for both services and goods, but a completely different recovery so far in terms of both imports and exports on the goods side compared to the services side. Um, despite another slowdown in economic growth, both uh, Canadian goods exports and imports have surpassed their respective pre-pandemic levels uh, by the end of the first quarter of 2021. Uh, whereas in contrast, uh, the services trade problems have persisted through the first quarter of 2021. Um, Jeffrey and Lori both talked about travel restrictions uh, and the impact that that has had. Um, but by the end of uh, the first quarter of 2021, uh, services exports and imports were 15 and 34% below their respective levels compared to February, 2020. Next slide, please, Carlo. I wanted to provide again to the point that Jeffrey was making about the unevenness of, uh, of the impact. If we look at uh, different sectors here, although there are significant impacts over the course of 2020, uh, you'll see by comparison to what was happening with a number of the industries, if you go down to about the seventh or eighth of those that talks about food production, farm and fishing, we see a significant increase of about 15% in terms of growth in that regard. Forestry, about the same as it was. Same is true of metal and non-metallic um, mineral products. So very, very different impacts on an industry by industry uh, basis of what transpired in uh, 2021. I, I was uh, doing some outre outreach work during the course of this time and uh, was a surprised to, to learn, for example, that uh, Canadian grain wheat had, had a record year potash as well, uh, one of their best uh, years on record. And uh, so this was a, a big issue. If we look at this in the context of um, how this has been differentiated by um, our, uh, our trade partners, uh, you can see here with reference to services trade that uh, the United States is highlighted here to give some indication of where we're at with respect to uh, some of the cross-border implications with significant declines in 2020 on both imports and exports that I previously referenced as leading uh, the decline. Next one, please, Carlo. Here's a, an interesting picture too. If you look at the goods as opposed to services trade, by partner again, significant declines in the United States on both fronts, but contrasted by very different outcomes. If you look at the lines that pertain to imports and exports in China or the United Kingdom, for example. Um, so a, a really uh, important when we're thinking about responses to recognize and understand the differences and unevenness of both impacts and recovery opportunities. Next slide, please, Carlo. So um, just a, a few very quick comments to conclude. One of the things that I think we really need to pay attention to when we think about the Canada-US border is that through the pandemic, we've learned that the uh, disruptions that we've seen, whether they're at terminals in China, problems with the blockage of the Suez Canal, or more close to home transportation specific issues, these tend to have a cascading effect. It's not as though these appear in isolation. Um, the best description I saw that I've coined here 
for the presentation is that the pinch point is the entire supply chain. Uh, these impacts are not ones that are uh, isolated. And in addition to that, um, I think it's really important as we think through what to do about this, that we understand that most forecasters are projecting that supply chain disruptions are going to cause backlogs that will continue for an extended period of months and perhaps a year. Others have it even going further out than that. I think this is an important thing from a standpoint of, of planning. Um, a second point, which I've already commented on is that, um, and all of us understand is that there's going to be continued uncertainty. The difficulty in making accurate predictions about what's going to happen is very difficult and will continue to be significantly impacted by the direction of COVID variants. Um, I've tried to highlight for you with some of the earlier slides, some of the risks of the pandemic and how uneven these are from an industry perspective, from a locational perspective and so forth. Um, these, these really need to be thought through in the context of, uh, as Jeffrey said, the individual circumstances in each industry or sector and uh, how we need to manage those um, in different ways. Um, my final point that I wanted to make through the slides is that I think many of our audience will be uh, uh, specifically aware of some of the transportation cost increases, which in terms of things like um, containerized access have quadrupled or in some cases been even higher than that. But I think uh, it's really important to understand that what's emerging now is the not just the cost issue, but the reliability factor is probably the biggest issue to consider. Um, we have spent so much time in the supply chain and logistics world focused on just-in-time technologies as the driving rationale for the kinds of improvements and efficiencies that we're looking for, um, that companies have now come to appreciate that they need to rethink this. And while there's been lots of discussion of nearshoring, not a lot of evidence of that so far, but a real need to think through just-in-case thinking around providing sufficient uh, support for inventories that can be built up to ensure that they don't have supply shortages. Warehousing, for example, has accelerated tremendously uh, in terms of the leasing trends, which tend to be a lesser cost component compared to some of the transportation inputs. Uh, the numbers I saw for July were up by over 50% over the year previous as uh, companies are looking to ensure that they have some basis to be able to provide some redundancy and some supply. A number of opportunities that uh, I won't go into here um, around the application of technologies, some very interesting work being done by some of the industry associations. A recent pilot, I think uh, within the last couple of weeks announced between uh, Ontario and Michigan. Um, and there are some opportunities, I think, as Jeffrey alluded to, to do a much better job on cooperation strategies. I noted in looking at some of the capital plans for the transportation industries across uh, the prairies that each of the three prairie provinces had identified um, enhanced north-south access as a key priority in terms of the work that they see doing. But in order for that to succeed, we need to, we need to be very cognizant of what happens on the other side of the border. So I'll stop there and allow us to get to some of the questions and discussion. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, John. Uh, and again, apologies, folks, but we're policy pinheads, not, uh, not IT geeks around here. And with the office pretty much closed down, you can be sure <laughs> there isn't another body to go grab. So again, Q&A uh, queue is open up. But let me start out with a um, question for Lori and then one for Jeff. And the question also goes to John as well. Uh, and again, this is John in your capacity as a former deputy minister, or someone uh, who had a seat uh, inside government. So the question for Lori, you know, in your presentation, you know that the lack of work um, at the congressional level the, the focus of this as an issue and the work of your institute, our friends at Woodrow Wilson and others with whom we work on border issues, pushing for this. But you're probably aware that the Americans and the Mexicans just restarted the high level economic dialogue. This was that old post NAFTA, let's get beyond 
dealing with the irritant of the moment and sit down and focus on how we make the border and how we make the two economies work to be better. So they've started this up again. And what came out of that was a working group on enhancing border efficiency, a focus on trade infrastructure and trade facilitation. So my question for you is, are we falling behind as it seems? Are there other things that are happening that maybe gives us a chance to catch up? And if not, what can we do out here across the prairies at sort of the grassroots, the political, the business level to, to really push this? Because you know, I was really struck by the announcement of uh, Kamala ha Vice President Harris's meeting. Oh my God, the HLED is back. And not only is it back, they're talking concrete plan to prioritize the US-Mexico border. So while you're thinking about that, uh, Jeff, in looking at the barometer report, at the very end was a chart with subnational engagement. And the chart was broken down by region, Cascadia, Prairies, Horseshoe, Maritimes, and then going out a list of the various forum mechanisms, et cetera. You look down and Cascadia, that horizontal line is filled. The horseshoe, there are a number of things along uh, that, uh, that axis. And even for the Maritimes, there are a couple of things. And these include private sector groups. But when you look at the prairies, the only thing you see there is the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. It's a, a division that's Cascadia and the prairies lumped together, whereas every other region seems to have its own robust institutional framework. Uh, your comments about that, is that an issue? Are there things we can do about it and that we should do about it? And also, Laurie, um, if you want to jump in on that one, you know, the list of groups that you mentioned working on the border in your chart, the private sector in Cascadia, I think, is there. Um, you have access to private sector groups, they're taking part. But when we set up this webinar, we tried to get prairie private sector organizations, business associations, chambers uh, that have links on both sides to join us, and we weren't able to do that. I imagine that if you were trying that out in Cascadia, it wouldn't have been an issue to get private sector groups or two chambers or two business associations that regularly work with each other on border issues to show up. I know that's not the case. It's not an issue in Cascadia. It's not an issue in the Horseshoe. It's less of an issue in the Maritimes. And John, you've got perspectives on both of these uh, questions from having worked, um, been a deputy minister in government out in Saskatchewan. So Lori, first one to you. Okay, that's a lot of questions, but I will be brief. Um, and I think, are we falling behind? Yes, I think we are. I mean, I think throughout this whole pandemic, the standard line we kept hearing was the US and Canada are in constant communication where every month we're meeting and we're rolling out these restrictions. And we were told that up until the day that all of a sudden we clearly weren't, right? I mean, we're, we're not really engaged in the way that we should be. But I also think that the US and Canada have different tools at their disposal than the US and Mexico do. And so I think in the US Canadian case, if we have that top level leadership, if we have a new border policy accord, which we usually have, then the agency collaboration will really sort of fall into place because those relationships, while they were challenged and they were frayed under the Trump administration, they're still there. And we still know how to work together and we still want to, but we need that direction and we need that structure to be able to do so. Um, I think also just having ongoing leadership outside of these times of crisis is really important. So I think Jeffrey was the one that sort of said, you know, you, you want to have these relationships in place before everything falls apart. And so regionally, you know, I think part of that question was what can the regions do is foster those relationships and, and keep them going. And what we this will sort of, I guess, feed into the, the second question you have, which is, you know, out here in the Pacific Northwest, the thing that really, um, sort of separates us from other areas of the border on cross-border collaboration is that we have agencies and organizations whose day job it is to engage in cross-border collaboration. That doesn't really exist in other places, at least not to the same extent that it does. That means we have funding support. It means we have 
leadership, we have mandates and we have the time to engage in these relationships and keep them going. And it's really that, that longevity and that capacity that builds up trust. And if you don't have trust, then you're not going to be collaborating in, in times of crisis, right? So we have great leadership from our governor and our premier at the top level. And then we have communities on the ground, which for decades have worked together because they recognize it's just a given that it makes sense to work with your neighbors. And I think that really has allowed these sort of multi-scalar and not necessarily cross-sectoral um, alliances to develop, but it's provided a really robust kind of relational infrastructure that exists outside of the turnover of political leaders, which I think is really important as well. With regard to cross-border relationships, I think the difference between um, Cascadia and the interior of DC the, and most of the areas is that cross-border relationships are almost entirely centered. Uh, Pinworth's success has been to bring ongoing engagement and relationship at a sector level. Uh, I can pick up the agri-food sector uh, and particularly the, uh, the meat processing and uh, red meat sector as, as an example. Uh, there has been ongoing discussion of cross-border animal health issues for, for, uh, for many years uh, involving not just the ranchers, not just the meat processor, but the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, to the point that they are down into the weeds on technical issues, not just a border management, but a supply chains. And we saw that despite the massive disruption in the meat processing sector, you actually had a net increase in cross-border trade, as John pointed out, in his slide. And that was a function of uh, effective coordination, effective communication. The one breakdown uh, in that effective communication was federal provincial uh, with regard to set aside programs and ongoing agri recovery programs, which involved different priorities of federal and provincial governments. Uh, but by and large, because you had that sectoral engagement, things work. Uh, the border communities tend to be at a considerable distance from their counterparts in the United States. Uh, I've done research on this in other contexts, and uh, the connections are almost entirely personal. Uh, the institutional connections are relatively weak. You add that to the long distance shipments of major commodities, which go well into the Midwest and the central Great Plains states in the United States and across the Pacific Northwest. And uh, you don't have that focal point for activity that you do have with the Ontario, Michigan or the Ontario, New York relationship or the Quebec, New York relationship. You have that with BC and Washington, uh, but the diffusion of Alberta's trade, uh, Saskatchewan's trade with counterparts the South is, is, does not encourage uh, hands-on cooperation and in-depth relationship building. I think it's a little different between uh, Manitoba and North Dakota, uh, as we saw uh, with the trucking vaccination that was building on existing relationships through NASCO and other organizations, but the, uh, as well as a direct relationship between governor and premier. Uh, but uh, th that's the exception that proves the rule uh, across most of the areas. Thanks. So, uh, you know, we've had the uh, responses. We've had several questions come in, and uh, Lori uh, has been answering some of them. I've been answering some of them. So we're going to stick with uh, this one. But we'll give the, the last bit to, to John, um, his thoughts on those two questions and the responses. Um, maybe just two or three quick comments to add to what's already been said, because I think it's very much on point. The first thing that I would highlight is that I think there's a real opportunity to consider um, private-public cooperation, uh, where I think there are lessons and cross-pollinization opportunities <clears throat> between government and the private sector. For example, uh, I think it was uh, this past year, 
but certainly within a 12 month period, something more like six or eight months, as I recall, in the southern part of Saskatchewan, there were announcements of four major new canola crushing operations, each of which was in the hundreds of millions of dollars each to add capacity in the middle of the pandemic, where the catchment areas that they were describing were not related to political borders. These are very much determined on the basis of what um, is, is driven by the industry and offers opportunities, I think, for learnings that can uh, also contribute to regulatory uh, considerations and public policy as well. And I, and I think, you know, if there's a lesson that we've seen in the more successful past history in these areas on the government side, it is that whenever the private sector comes to the table, uh, it's an enriched discussion. There's a better understanding of the issues. And this is, these are coming from my colleagues at the federal and provincial level who are articulating the value of, of having that kind of interaction. So I think there are some opportunities for some real learnings if we bring together the best from the private and public sector to work collaboratively on these issues. There you go, thanks. That takes us to the end of time, but uh, Laurie, Jeff, any last comments uh, you'd like to leave our viewers with? I, I'd throw two things in. One is that, you know, as a region, you can also tie into the broader binational efforts such as North American Strategy for Competitiveness or the Future Borders Coalition. Those are umbrella organizations um, that you could certainly rely on and tap into and engage in conversation with. And then I just want to say thank you, Carlo, for bringing attention to the border barometer. It was a, a labor of love. It was a lot of work, but I think it provides some really valuable information. And it's something that I think many of us would like to continue to do and, and be useful and relevant for many of you out there. So thanks. I think, thank you, Carlo, again, for, for convening this. I think one of the challenges that we do face is getting past the unilateralism that has characterized uh, the last several months of cross-border reopening. Uh, the fact is a lot of people have retreated into their society. And it's absolutely critical for organizations like the Canada West Foundation to start re rebuilding bridges uh, at a regional level uh, that will engage across a wide range of uh, sectors uh, to bring decision makers to the table. Because if we aren't talking to one another, we'll be talking past one another. Thank you, and that's a great segue to close. For, for the Canada West Foundation, you know, the subnational engagement is the third tier of our work, the work that John and I do on trade infrastructure and improving Canada's ability to identify, plan um, trade infrastructure to catch up with Australia, the UK, and our competitors is one component dealing with trade relations in Asia. China as a global power, not just dealing with China in China, but dealing with China in Brazil, Indonesia, and other markets. But the subnational is a major focus too. And I think we're going to shift our work to look at you know, the infrastructure and the mechanisms to be able to deal with the pandemic, to deal with the border, and to find ways to replace some of what nature hasn't given us along this border. <laughs> We don't have the benefit of having Seattle, uh, you know, a, a, a couple hours drive away or, you know, Buffalo or, or New York. So we're going to have to do some thinking about that. And I'll announce that right now I'm starting fundraising to raise money to pay Jeffrey Hale to write a <laughs> policy brief for us, <laughs> taking from the border barometer and looking ahead on subnational engagement. So folks, if you like what you heard, and you want some more work, uh, we're taking toonies, loonies, and uh, even $5 bills to be able to get Jeff to do some more work for us. Again, this will be posted. Um, Lori's answered most of the questions that have come in. I've answered a few, but I'd like to, again, thank John Law, our senior fellow for uh, the Trade and Investment Center here at Canada West, uh, Professor Jeffrey Hale down at Lethbridge, I'll be down in Cardston, I think, in a couple of weeks. I may stop off and see you. And of course, uh, Dr. Lori Troutman at the uh, Border Policy Research Institute. I think I got it correct. Uh, great collaborators, 
and good advocates for Canada and Western Canada down there in the US. Again, thank you everyone. I look forward to continue working with you and questions we didn't get to, we'll try and get to, and this again will be posted. So everyone take care, stay safe.